Hi, welcome to Think Tech Asia, coming to you from downtown Honolulu. Uh, I'm your host, Hong Jiang, Associate Professor of Geography from University of Hawaii at Manoa. And my guest today is Professor Alex Golub from uh, Anthropology Department at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And our topic is Mining in the Pacific, Lessons from the Pogora Gold Mine. Um, as uh, the global economy grows, mining companies are going more and more into previously remote areas. Um, so what kind of impact uh, this kind of expansion is going to have for both the local people, local community, um, consumers like us, and also the companies themselves. These are very important issues. So Professor Golub is going to share his insight from his work based on uh, the uh, Pogora uh, pa gold mine in Papua New Guinea. Um, Alex, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to be here. Um, first, um, this uh, gold mine, the Pogora gold mine, uh, I, my, I have to confess, I haven't paid much attention to it. It seems to be a very classical case of the conflict that's going on between the um, expansion of global capital and the local people. I think it's an example of the kind of thing that we're seeing more and more these days, where global forces are able to reach into areas that previously might not have been as connected as they used to be. And uh, I think that's one of the main reasons that I was interested in studying it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, th that's great. Um, so um, maybe uh, we'll have you talk about your work a little bit. Control room, can you bring up uh, uh, photo number 13? Well, um, yeah, uh, my original PhD work was on this topic, and it's just been published in this book, Leviathans at the Gold Mine, uh, which is about Porgra. And uh, the title of the book refers to uh, Leviathan, which the political scientist, or I guess philosopher, Thomas Hobbes used as a symbol of uh, government power. Back in England, in the Renaissance, Hobbes said, you know, the state is like a leviathan, the giant chaos beast that's mentioned in the Bible in the book mm -hmm. of Genesis. Uh, so many people today think about global capitalism as being like that leviathan, powerful, conquering, remorseless. Uh, and I wanted to talk about something a little bit more more uh, nuanced than that kind of stereotype. I wanted to study the formation of two leviathans. I wanted to study how it was that a global mining company ends up in rural Papua New Guinea operating mm -hmm. a huge gold mine, which is mm -hmm. sort of an amazing feat to do. But I also wanted to talk about the way in which ethnic identity in the valley ended up being bureaucratized or corporatized, how a group of people there who might have had lots of different ways of mm -hmm. living, relating, and belonging, how those people ended up becoming the Ippoli. Uh, and the reason that they ended up becoming the Ippoli as an ethnic group was the mine showed up and said, we have millions, perhaps billions of dollars of benefits to give away to whoever is the customary landowner of this mountain. Who is it? And at that point, it turned mm -hmm. out that lots of people considered themselves to be the owner of that mountain. So I really wanted to see how these two things were happening simultaneously, how the company was being formed in reaction to the community, but also how the community was being shaped by the presence of the company. And that's, that's the t where the title of the book comes from. And that's what we're going to learn today with this program with you, uh, to learn about the complexities of uh, the both sides, the both the, 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 the company side and also the local community side. It's not a simple image of uh, you know, uh, who's right, who's wrong, uh, which is uh, really fascinating. Um, so let's have a uh, um, control room. Let's bring up a map uh, of uh, number one. So let me show you, to orient you a little bit, Papua New Guinea um, is the uh, country, one of two countries that shares the island of New Guinea. So the west half of the island of New Guinea is called Papua. It's, uh, I guess, formerly part of Indonesia, although there is a movement for independence there, which is gaining steam and has been very important. The right half is the independent country of Papua New Guinea. And uh, so the geography is a little bit confusing. It's just north of Australia. Many people know it as an important battle site for World War II. Uh, it's where the Battle of the Coral Sea took place, where the Japanese advance was halted, uh, and uh, that's one of the main reasons that many people know it. 
Many people also know it because there's a lot of missionary work. There are a lot of missionaries who are sent to Papua New Guinea. So um, it's, it's viewed as sort of one of the classically, uh, I guess, like primitive or savage places. I don't really see it as primitive or savage. But when people think about New Guinea, they have all these ideas about headhunters and cannibalism and all that sort of thing. One of the reasons that I wanted to do the study I did was to show that uh, there's a lot of things going on in Papua New Guinea mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, which are not headhunting and cannibalism, which are not really something people there do anymore. Uh, there's, there's mining. There's uh, resistance to mining. There's people with college degrees, Papua yeah. New Guineans in mm -hmm. suits with briefcases. So uh, that's why I was studying that. Um, should I talk a little bit about the mine? Uh, let's get to the uh, Pogori uh, gold mine. Um, sure. How did it start? Well, Papua New Guinea is right on the edge of the Pacific Rim. So it's one of these areas where, which are tremendously prospective, as we say, for minerals and for hydrocarbon. So mining in Papua New Guinea actually began in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, you know, California gold was discovered in the late 1840s. Then there's a big gold rush to Australia. And then uh, Australians moved up into Papua New Guinea looking for gold. There was a large mining operation uh, in the 30s, actually, uh, in the lower part of the country. Uh, and Papua New Guinea became a world center for air transport. It was the place that led the way in designing airplanes that could fly in and fly out huge loads. Amelia Earhart, I think her last voyage, she left from Ley in Papua New Guinea, uh, or maybe it was Wow, because Papua New Guinea was such a cen center for uh, aviation. So PNG is a place that's been at the center of technology and mining for a long time, or maybe if not the center, it's definitely one of the uh, most important places for moving this stuff forward. And uh, after world, uh, when World War II happened, that stopped because there was World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, but after the war, people began looking for minerals again in the country. Um, people, the government, which was at that time uh, basically Australian, the Australians oversaw the country, uh, supported prospecting. And when Papua New Guinea became independent in 1975, they saw mineral wealth as a way to uh, fund the budget of their new nation. Mm -hmm. So Papua New Guinea was one of the, the first big mines to open uh, in the wake of that period. The, the, uh, there was Bougainville, which is well known for being the first big mine in, in the country, uh, which was copper. Octeti was the second one. And then um, Misima, which was smaller, and then Porgara. So, PNG has been mining for a long time. In some sense, it's not as remote as many people think. Uh, but but Porgara is in the middle of the country. And it's, it's very difficult to get to. And um, opening a mine there was really a tremendous feat, technically and socially. Uh, so when did uh, Porgara start to be uh, opened? Uh, I, uh, the exact date is in my book. And now that I'm in front of a television camera, I cannot remember the exact day. It was the late 80s, early 90s. Oh, I think okay. the first gold pour was 89. And then I think the first year of full production was, was 90. Yeah. Um, so I, I understand in your book you talk about how did it, uh, the, the POGRA first started by the can, uh, Canadian um, uh, company that uh, set up the gold mine. Can you talk a little bit about the, the initial setup? How did the company come in? How did they work with the local people? Because right now we understand there's a lot of conflicts in the area. Mm -hmm. um, but how was it uh, started? How did it uh, happen in the beginning? Well, in, in the beginning, um, the government encouraged local people to pan for gold. Okay. And there were Australians who uh, were panning for gold uh, in that area that was very remote. So, um, so there were people doing small scale uh, alluvial gold working is what we call it, you know, mm -hmm. getting the pans and knocking it back and forth. Yeah, yeah. And um, when the government announced the that they were giving out exploration permits. The local people who had been living there, uh, who were in many times, uh, they were allied with the expatriate Australians who had been working there. Sometimes uh, those people, uh, the, the um, white people, I say this not because I'm racist, but because we call them white in Porgara. Because uh. uh, Porgarans uh, are, Porgara, Papua New Guinea is part of Melanesia, so people there are darkly complected. Okay. So, uh, like they would look black to us. Mm -hmm. And the Australians had a system that was, uh, uh, it was 
pretty, uh, it was pretty focused on color, let me put it that way. Oh. So in Papua New Guinea, people talk about white people and black people. That's why I use that term. I see. Okay. Yes. Uh, a lot of times, white people who came to the valley to work would end up marrying into local tribes. Mm -hmm. So they would create like kinship alliances. Mm. Um, slowly, things got bigger and bigger. Prospecting came in. And local companies would hire, uh, international companies would hire whoever the local big men and prominent people were to develop the thing. And when Placer Dome finally got interested in it, that was when real money got brought to the table. There was a large exploration budget. Uh, serious drilling began, diamond tip drilling to, uh, to check for a prospect for gold. And, um, and that's really what happened. When they found sort of the mother load vein that demonstrated that the mine was feasible to work, and they figured out the technology for getting the gold out of the ground, because the gold in Porgra is combined with sulfur, mm -hmm. so it needs to be treated in a special way to, okay. to be freed. Mm -hmm. um, when that happened, then the mine said, this is it, we want to build a mine here. And they uh, began contacting the government, and they said, give us a special mining lease, and uh, we're ready to go. And that mm -hmm. was the point at which negotiations with local landowners really began. Okay. Yeah. Uh, was uh, Clearly, it started, and it, w it seems to be a smooth transaction in the beginning, right? In terms of, uh, the was it the Placer Dome came in? Uh, this is the Canadian company came in uh, and, and built up the company uh, or started to mine the area and take the land from the local people. How, how did that transition, transaction go? Well, uh, Porgura has, has always been a place where there's been a lot of conflict. I think uh, Porgura and people uh, like conflict and argument and uh, all this kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, they're, they're, uh, that's just the, the culture there. Some people are sort of more active than others, and that's sort of the culture in Porgra. Mm -hmm. um, and gold, I think, really added to that. So there were, there were court cases between Australians and uh, Porgra and gold miners in the early 1950s. Mm. So there's always been a long history of who does this gold belong to, who's going to get the money, how is this going to work. That's been going on for a long time. Okay. Yeah. But the thing is that in the past, people have always managed to keep it together. Mm. They've always found a way to, to keep the valley spinning, to keep it going. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think t in now at the moment, uh, that's, that's broken down. Tell, tell us about some of the conflicts that's happening there because it's, it, it seems very, very severe. Well, Porgara today is facing a number of challenges. Uh, the first challenge is the social conditions for the people who are living there. The way that the mine works is there's a special mining lease which has been given to the mine. And uh, the government has said you can do anything you want on that lease. It's yours. You can destroy it if you need to. You can dig it up. That special mining lease, or SML, is basically, um, we've written it off, it's yours, you can do whatever you want. Now, the uh, landowners at Porgara, when, when they signed the agreement with the mine, and I can go into how these agreements work if you're interested, it gets a little complex. Basically, the mine said, do you want us to move you off of the special mining lease and we'll relocate you somewhere else? Mm -hmm. And Porgren said, no way, we want to stay put. We want to monitor what's going on. Every time you knock down a tree, we want to make sure that we get paid in accordance with the compensation agreement that we've mm. signed. We want to stay on site and active and engaged in our community. So it's a lease uh, of the land to be used by the company, but it's not selling off the land. Uh, yes, that's right. In, under Papua New Guinean law, uh, land cannot be alienated because it belongs to future generations of Papua New Guineans. I see. Okay. But the government of Papua New Guinea can issue a long-term lease. Okay. And it doesn't need the local people's permission. Mm -hmm but it does need them to sign off on different kinds of compensation agreements. I see. Okay. So it's a little bit of an unusual situation because there's three, you can think of it in terms of three actors. There's the national government in the capital, Port Moresby. There's local people in Porgara, and then there's the mining company. The government and the mining company can sign an agreement, but the Porgrans have to be partner to it, uh, at least for compensation or else it's illegal. And then, of course, they have to buy into it or else there's no social license to operate and the mine can't really go forward. 
That's interesting, and, and it seems uh, the situation can be complicated. And that seems to be one of the factors that led to some of the conflicts uh, that uh, we're going to explore further. Mm -hmm. So let's take a, a short break. Um, this is a Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Hong Jiang, and we've been speaking with uh, uh, Professor Alex Golub about mining in the Pacific lessons from the Pagora gold mine. We'll be right back. I'm Jake Fidel. That's Sharon Moriwaki of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And every Wednesday, we have Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We've been doing it for some time now, and we have some fantastic guests on there, unbelievable guests who give us insight into what is going on in a very complex, sometimes very confusing, sometimes very disappointing <laughs> area of, of progress in the state. So we love doing this. We love meeting them. We love talking to them. We love having their ideas out on the table. So maybe, just maybe, we can all make some sense of what's going on. Sharon, what do you think? Thing. I think that's absolutely correct. We enjoy we enjoy ourselves meeting with all these people <laughs> and hearing about the energy and the state of clean energy and hopefully we advance clean energy for the state. So it's terrific. Join us. Come okay, join it's us. every Wednesday. Okay, Wednesday is Energy Day. Every energy Wednesday, Wednesday, four to five p.m. Hawaii, the state of clean energy here on Think Tech Hawaii. Energy we'll Wednesday. see you there. Hi, we're back. We're live. This is Think Tech Asia, and uh, this this is uh, uh, Hong Jiang, your host. And we've been talking about mining in the Pacific. So, Alex, right before the break, we were talking, uh, get start to get into the conflict. Um, uh, perhaps a control room. Let's look at uh, uh, photo number 10 first. So uh, we'll have you explain some of uh, what's going on sure. on the ground. So, so I talked previously about how Papua New Guinea is the home to many mines. And this is just a map from the um, Chamber of Mining and Petroleum, a business group in Papua New Guinea, which shows uh, where Porgora is in the map. It's right up in the middle of the country. Uh, it's right in the middle there. It's a little dot maybe you can see. But this is just a good example of showing you that Porgora is uh, one of many mining and hydrocarbon developments in the country. And the country is just going to have more probably as since prices are staying high. So, um, so this is a map that shows the value of uh, understanding Papua New Guinea as a modern place that's subject to a lot of resource development. Yeah. Is Pogra uh, the largest gold mine in uh, Papua New Guinea? You know, it's an interesting question. Um, it depends on how you define largest. I, I, in the early 90s, Porgora was the third largest gold mine in the world mm. um, based on the amount of uh, gold produced per year. The only two mines that were larger were in South Africa, and they're always the largest mines in the world. Um, but Porgora has been open now for two decades, uh, so it's like what they would call a mature mine. Mm -hmm. And I think Lahir might be pouring more gold these days in New Ireland. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. It's, it's one of the largest mines in the country, and I, it, I don't have the figures in front of me, but it accounts for a significant percentage of the GDP, like 10% of the country's GDP, I think. I, uh, I can imagine. Let's look at control room. Let's look at uh, photo number five. I'm moving on to six. So this is a good example of the Porgara mine. As you can see, it's changed a lot over the years, but basically it's a large open cut mine. So it's highly mechanized. Uh, this is not a case where there's hundreds of miners with buckets you know, covered in mud the way you might see in some magazines. They use absolutely huge trucks and huge machinery to move stuff. Um, I think there might be a picture of that in there somewhere. It's a very rugged area. Yes, it is. It is not easy to get to. Mm -hmm. It's uh, about 7,000 feet above sea level. Uh, it's cold and it's wet pretty much all the time. There is a lot of mud. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, uh, I had a lot of mud when I was living in Papua New Guinea, uh, but it's also incredibly beautiful. There's a lot of limestone. So uh, you have these huge, tremendous bluffs that just rise up and mountains and peaks. It's, it's amazingly beautiful, the mist coming up off of the mountains. It's incredible. Wow. Yeah. Um, next photo, please. Yeah. So, so the scale of mining that goes on is absolutely amazing here. Uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of tons of earth moved every day, I would say. Uh, although, again, I don't have the figures right in front of me. With this, uh, well, we'll uh, at the very end, we'll bring up your book again. People can go to your book and, and read, uh, yeah. learn about all the details. Uh, next photo, please. Uh, so, you know, we saw the picture of the guy standing in front of the truck. I don't know if you can even see the human in this picture, uh -huh. but you can get a sense of the size of the mine when you realize that that truck is the size of, you know, like a two or three story building. 
and, uh, and it's just, you can't even see the top of the mine from the bottom of the open pit. That's the scale of uh, mine that we're looking at here. Wow. The mine also has an underground component, which you can see in this picture at various times. The mine has had an underground tunnels as well as an open pit. And uh, I think at the moment they have uh, underground operations as well. So it's mostly an open cut, but there, there is also some underground mining there. Yeah. Okay, so we, we get some visual sense of the, the uh, scale of the big mine over here that's going on here. Um, so let's come back to the uh, topic of uh, the conflicts that's um, been ongoing. Well, when I, when I lived in Porgora from 1999 to 2001, uh, just about two years in that three-year period, uh, and I've returned since then. And the reason that I wrote my dissertation and eventually my book, Leviathans at the Gold Mine, the way that I did was because Porgora was an example of a success story. Uh, when the government uh, and Placer wanted to open a mine in the valley, Porgora said, not unless if we get a piece of it. And they managed to negotiate in an incredible agreement with the mine. They got a new school, new hospital, a new airstrip a trust fund to pay for their children's tuition, royalty payments to individual people. They got a share of the mine. They were stockholders in the mine. They owned oh, wow. equity in the mine. Um, uh, preferential treatment for hiring, uh, contracts to do mine work. So it, for me, when I first was there in the late 90s, it was really the study of a success story. How mm -hmm. had this small group of people managed to um, extract so many benefits from this mining company? Mm -hmm. Uh, since then, unfortunately, uh, in many ways, Porgora has become a failure. And uh, the social situation in the valley today is very, very serious. There is a high level of alcohol, a high level of drinking, a high level of violence. Mm -hmm. There is a high level of sexual violence, including absolutely horrific uh, crimes against women. Yeah. Um, and there's been a series of incidents in which uh, mine employees have... Um, uh, I mean, uh, shot people in the back, uh, that's the, I mean, in, in at least one case. Mm. Uh, so uh, there's also been incidences where the police have been called in and the police have acted, in, I should say mobile squads, which is part of the Papua New Guinea state, um, have, have done things that are, are unethical as well. So uh, I sometimes tell people who've seen the, the HBO series Deadwood, it's like that. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's really like that if you've seen Ted Wood. What do you think happened that, that led to all the conflicts and all the problems? Uh, when you first got there, you thought it was a success story. What, what changed? Well, it's been a long time. And as I said earlier on, Porgra has always been a place where there's been conflict, where the stakes have always been high, okay. where there's been a lot of gold and a lot of people who uh, were not wealthy. Mm -hmm. You know, when you, when you grow up in a uh, house that you've built yourself out of wood, uh, eating uh, the sweet potatoes that you grew in your own garden, and you hear about people who live in houses with air conditioning and eat mm -hmm. meat every day, uh, and then you know that you can just get just, you know, a handful of gold and you could be set for months or years, uh, the stakes are pretty high. So I think really what happened was the... The, the agreements that were made in the late 80s and early 90s to keep the valley going just slowly decayed over time. Mm. And, and they weren't uh, continually renewed and there wasn't a sense of, there weren't personnel at the mine and government officials and valley leaders who could work together to keep those agreements going or make new ones. Mm. That's one problem. Okay. Uh, I think the second problem was just radical, radical social change. One of the m most important ones being the influx of many, many, many new people into the valley. Migration, in migration. So Pogra became rich and people in the surrounding area started to pour in. That's right. It, originally there was no road into the valley. There was a really, really poor track that took a lot of time to go over. Mm. If you wanted to get into the valley, you had to fly in one of the small planes that was operated that flew in and out. Well, the first time they brought a car into the valley, they had to carry it on people's shoulders. And then oh, once, my God. <laughs> yeah, once they got it into the valley, then they could drive it around. But um, Porgren said, we want a road. We want to be connected with the rest of the world. The problem was, once that road was built, then people everybody could show in. up. That's yeah. right. Oh, wow. Uh, so one of the, one of the challenges is, is uh, facing a situation where you, as they say in PNG, you could become a stranger on your own land because so many people have moved in. Mm. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit, explain a little bit of the dynamic when people came in from the other area 
do they start to have conflict with the mind? Well, the, one of the problems is that porgrins are very accommodating. They're very outward looking. They're very modern and entrepreneurial. They want to make connections. They want to make new friends. Okay. So in many ways, uh, porgrins wanted new people to come in. Okay. Um, it's very difficult, I think, for people to talk about a problem with in-migrants uh, or migrants who've come into the valley because to you, the five people who live in your house are your in-laws, hmm. right? But to everyone else, they're migrants. I so see. you have a situation where you know other people's in-laws, you think the valley would be better off if they weren't around. But of course yours, you know, uh, you want them to be there. They're, they're in many cases the people who are uh, recipients of your aid and benefit. You can become their client to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. um, but then eventually the problem is if too many people come in, then that gets reversed. Okay. There's also just issues with uh, Anga as a province which has faced many troubles, including a lot of armed conflict, what people would call tribal fighting. And um, there's a lot of unemployed people. Papua New Guinea is having trouble keeping its economy growing outside of the mining sector. Education system is not what it once was. There's a lot of 20-year-old kids who want something to do. Okay. And there's a lot of booze in Porgara and a lot of money, a lot of gambling, mm -hmm. a lot of opportunities. What's the role of the company, the mining company now, in this whole kind of uh, conflicts and uh, decaying of the situation? Well, the, I, I think that the mining company feels like it's not its job to be the government of Papua New Guinea. Okay. If there are law and order problems, then the government should introduce law and order. Um, but the government, Papua New Guinea really um, is challenged by a civil service that uh, is not particularly strong. Some people might say not functioning in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, the provincial government can sometimes be very politicized in terms of who gets appointments. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, the mine is always getting dragged in to do the role of the state. Okay. For instance, there's a tax credit scheme where the mine gets tax credit for building schools. Mm. So uh, the mine says, uh, people come to the mine, they say, build a school in our village. The mine says, it's not our job to build schools. It's the government's job to build schools. And they say, well, if you don't do that, then we're going to um, hijack the next supply uh, tra uh, truck that comes up the road. Oh, and wow. the yeah, and then, which happens um, because the mine is supplied entirely by this one highway. Mm. So it's quite vulnerable, um, which is what gives local people power, which can be good but also bad. Mm. So then the mine says, well, we do have this tax credit scheme, so maybe we could arrange a school. Wow. Yeah. So that's one problem. The mine is willing to say that it's responsible for some of the social issues that people face, but not everything. And of course, everyone who's not the mine says, the international activists, Porgerins, would say, you need to take a bigger share of responsibility. Okay. okay. The second thing is that the mine has this area, which is the special mining lease, which is an industrial area where they have rights. They can trespass people. They can um, destroy houses, destroy trees without any kind of permission. The permission to destroy those things was signed years ago. Uh. But they just have to be compensated. People have to be compensated when those things are destroyed. I see. You know, so the mine has carte blanche within this area, and yet there's thousands of people living in this area. Mm. Originally, Ippoli people, but now increasingly people from outside. So the mines don't have a right to say, well, you know, this is the area we lease, you can't move in. The mine doesn't have the right to say that, right? Well, I, I'm not a lawyer. I think the mine would say that it does have that right. Mm -hmm. And if it wanted to call in, if, if it spoke, this is, I think, how the mine might put it. Uh, if it was to contact the government of Papua New Guinea and request members of the army and police to come in to enforce their rights, it would be doing so legally and would be promoting law and order in Papua New Guinea. Mm. But what um, Porgerins and, um, and mining activists would say is, the mine is using the army to do whatever, and the police to do whatever it wants. Mm. And yeah. the mine has its own, from what I read, its own security forces as well. That's right. The mine does have security forces that are that are operating, especially within the pit. There, you know, there's lots of areas of the special mining lease 
where people live there, it's their homes, there isn't a large mine presence. As a matter of fact, if you were a mine, if you had a mine outfit and you drove a mine car into that area, you would be stoned and attacked. I've mm -hmm. seen that happen. Oh, wow. Like when they tried to drop me off after meetings, people, I get out of the car, don't, don't, it's me. They're just <laughs> dropping me off. Oh, wow. Um, but, but the open pit, as you've seen from those pictures, is an incredibly hostile place. But what people will do is get water and food and um, go into that open pit, walking amongst the machinery, climb up, find a niche, and begin extracting gold from the ore that's in the pit. Uh, so people would go there, These, the local people, the immigrants, who, who would just go to the, the, the mine site and to start to pick up stuff. Yes, that's right. Sometimes they'll find, um, they'll find tunnels that have been left over from underground mining that are now above ground. They'll crawl in there, they'll stay there for like a week. Is that, uh, two things, is that dangerous for them? The second thing is that, uh, does that create a problem, a conflict between these people and the company, the mining company? It's incredibly hazardous to be in there, yeah, okay. it's very dangerous. Um, it, and it does create conflict, and that's the source of much of the problem that we see which is that many uh, security guards are put in a situation where they have people in that open pit working gold, they're trying to get them out. Um, sometimes the people who are working gold is, are armed. Mm. You, have, you have this problem in South Africa too, in underground mm. mines of people going in and working gold. Sometimes people, the, the Papua New Guineans, uh, I, I'm not sure if I should say this on TV, but, but it does happen occasionally, or it did happen occasionally. Uh, the Papua New Guineans who drive the trucks full of ore that's supposed to go into the processor, They'll say, they'll pretend that the truck is full of waste rock that's supposed to be put into a waste dump. Then they'll dump it in the waste dump. Their relatives will know about it. And they'll, they'll actually stand right underneath those huge trucks with the rocks coming out oh, to wow. try to get the gold. Wow. Yeah, so they're very, very aggressive, very entrepreneurial. They want the gold. The, and many of them just say it shouldn't be illegal or maybe it's not illegal for me to do this since it's my gold, it's my country. And it's my land. It's my land. Or maybe I come from down the road, but 10 generations ago, my mythic ancestor was their mythic ancestor's brother. So it's pretty much my land, and so I'm, I'm going to do it anyways. You can, you can see uh, the situation there. It's, it's not too orderly. And uh, uh, I understand the mining company has been accused of human rights abuses um, in the area, um, mistreating, mistreating the local people. I assume some of the conflicts came from these kind of uh, encounters. Yeah, I think many of the problems that we see uh, have to do with conflict in the, in the open pit. Uh, 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 you know, uh, as an anthropologist, it's important to maintain the privacy of your sources. But I, I think that um, th many of the issues that they see also come from security guards, uh, not necessarily even in the open pit, but in other locations doing activities, let me put it that way. Yeah. And I think, it's difficult, I think it's difficult for people to deny that these events are occurring. Okay. Everybody knows that they're occurring. What, what is at issue is who is responsible. When a, when a security guard shoots someone, is it the security guard's fault or is it his employer's fault? Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the place in which different interpretations would differ. I see. Okay, um, let's take another break. And after the break, let's explore some of the complexities of the, the conflicts. Um, so this is uh, uh, Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Hong Jiang. We've been talking about mining in the Pacific. We'll be right back. Hi, my name is Dr. Rafi. Every week, I'm right here at Think Tank Hawaii, 3 p.m. on Mondays. My show is Boards as Bio Briefings. What do we do here? Well, we watch sperm swim. We see if they catch anybody. We check out the latest biosimilars. You know, the kind that, uh, what was his name? The guy with the bicycle? Uh, I guess we forgot his name, but he was taking EPO and other human growth factors. We'll be talking about human growth factors. You want to know where to get some? Maybe I'll tell. Anyway, you can catch me, as I said, every week right here, Monday, 3 p.m., Think Tech Hawaii, Dr. Rafi. You can also find me on Twitter, BioInfo Medical. Or you can catch me on Facebook, Dr. Rafael Boritzer. I'll be happy to converse with you. Aloha. 
Hi, we're back. We're live. This is uh, Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Hong Jiang, and I've been speaking with uh, Professor Alex Golub um, about mining in the Pacific lessons from the Pogra gold mine. Uh, so let's, uh, let's give people, uh, the, our viewers, just a little bit of a, a sense of the local people uh, control room. Let's look at uh, photo number four. Yeah. You know, I wanted to show this picture because uh, we talk about uh, all this distressing stuff about social change, and um, so often uh, we, f we, we portray Porgrins as victims or helpless. I just wanted to show, like, there's tons of happy, normal people, <laughs> you know, people in Porgra living their lives. They face many, many challenges, but they're very resilient. And uh, I just wanted to show a picture of happy people instead of the pictures that you might see of people covered in mud and depressed and this kind of stuff. Porgrins love to laugh and they're very vivacious people. They're, they're good people. And I just wanted to show that. Yeah. Um, picture number 11, oh, number 12, please. So I wanted to show this picture um, to sort of summarize what's going on in the valley. This is a picture that a local Porgrin artist did. And the gold and black mountain is the logo of the mine. And surrounding the mine is Kupion, who is the python, who is sort of the ancestor of one of the clans that live there. He's the, he's the incarnation of local people. This is, what, this is what Porgrins wanted. They wanted a mine in their valley. And they wanted to get as much money from it as possible and as much benefits as possible. So that image of their snake squeezing the life out of the mining company, that's, that's uh, sort of what they wanted to have happen. Uh, what's the significance of the snake? Uh, the snakes, in, in, in a story, the snake saved two children who became the uh, ancestors of uh, one of the local clans there. I see. Yeah. So it's a, a kind of mythological uh, origin. It, it yeah, has yeah. He, he, lives in, he lives inside the mountain where the gold is. Uh -huh. And uh, people say that uh, his uh, feces or his skin becomes the gold after he sheds it or gets rid of it. Oh, I see. And there was a, a sacrificial site you would sacrifice to the snake. Uh, on the mountain, which has now completely been wiped out. Uh, control room, uh, photo 11, please. So people wanted to sort of squeeze the mine for benefits, but uh, what we often end up seeing instead is this situation. So this is a picture of local people uh, trying to talk to a very small window, and inside of the window there's a government officer, and he's handing out royalty checks. People who live in the valley who are Ippoli get checks. There's a list of local landowners, and you get a check quarterly, at least in principle. So uh, what happens is that there's a huge scrum as people try to get their checks from, the, from that person. And so this reality of a lot of people crammed around this small space trying to get their benefits in some ways symbolizes what's really happening in the valley now uh, increasingly. Um, so let's come back to the conflict itself in terms of, uh, uh, you know, in your work, your book, you've been talking about the complexities uh, of these conflicts. Um, I think, I, I, especially in today's world, a lot of times we look at the companies, uh, corporations coming into a local area, and uh, um, we often see local people as the victims and uh, corporations are doing the evil. So given your work, it, it's not that simple. Yeah, you know, I think the thing is that any time that you have a plot with only two characters in it, the story can only do so much. One person is the good guy, one person is the bad guy. So either you believe that the mining company is trying to help develop this area and they're being responsible, they promote corporate social responsibility, and then the local people are disorderly and bad, and so therefore they're the bad guys. Or you believe that the local people are good guys who are valiantly resisting the mine or maybe being victimized by the mine. But in reality, it's much more complicated. As I said, the earliest uh, prospectors in the valley had married into local Ippoli people. Um, today, when we talk about security guards operating the mine, those are Papua New Guinean security guards. Mm. Uh, when we talk about the people who head up many of the mining departments, they're Papua New Guinean. When we talk about um, landowners, many of those people have their power and position due to the result of their uh, businesses that they own, which were contracts that were given to them by the mine. So we talk in terms of there being two different groups, but the local politics are that it's really more complicated than that. Inside of the mine, there's good people. Uh, inside of the mine, there's bad people. Inside of the landowning groups, there's good people and bad people. And one of the things I want to show is that 
You just have to pay attention to what's really going on with local politics. You have to move beyond the idea that there's one person who's always the good guy and one person who's always the bad guy. Because unfortunately, life is not always like Star Wars, where mm -hmm. the good guys wear white and the bad guys wear black. Life is more complicated. Um, do you think uh, the change is happening too, too quickly, too fast, uh, for this area of Apogora? You know, uh, with, with the mines coming in and local people started to have this royalty money, and they, they, and they start to be able to live a different lifestyle. Um, but the, the, a lot of change is happening, and, and also the, all the immigrants moving in. I wonder about the speed of change, whether that also complicated the situation. Yeah, I think that things are happening very, very quickly. You know, the first Australian patrol into the valley, the first government exploratory patrol was in 1938. And uh, in 1989, the first gold was poured in Porgra. So people had gone from using stone tools to watching these enormous trucks rumble by the former side of their homes in one generation. I, I couldn't meet people who remembered what it was like to use stone tools. Um, when you were there in 2001, mm -hmm. Did people, do you see both people were using the stone tools and people who are living in a kind of a modern lifestyle? Oh, no, no. No one uses stone tools anymore. Oh, no, not, not anymore. <laughs> not, not in 2001. Yeah, no, okay. you got, no. People are like, I need a machete. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, people, people love tuna fish. I mean, they, they like clothes. They gave that stuff up pretty much as soon as they could. I don't know if you've ever tried to cut down a tree with the stone axe, but it's, it really sucks compared to using like a steel one. So, I, I yeah. can imagine. Yeah. But, the, but, you know, when it comes to the pace of change, uh, uh, one of the things that the government did and that the mine did was give Ippoli people what they wanted. They didn't say, you, we're not going to give you metal. Mm -hmm. We're going to keep you like um, animals in the zoo, preserved in your Stone Age way of life. Some, there are some governments in some countries that have done that, that have, uh, you know, attempted to keep cultures pristine. I think they said Ippoli are willing to, to embrace change, and we're going to try to do that with them. And the challenge of that is that social change and long-term social processes are difficult to control. Do you think, uh, you know, among the, uh, uh, the, the local people, is, uh, what do you call it, Ippoli? Yeah, uh, yeah. Among the Ippoli uh, people, uh, is there a vision of uh, what kind of future they wanted? Uh, do you see that kind of uh, effort to have a vision of, uh, you know, how, what do we want to do with this, this uh, uh, check that's coming in that, with, the, with the new schools that's being built up? I think that in the past, there had been certain leaders who had that vision, who sort of told people, this is where we're going, this is what we should do. There were leaders in the mine and leaders in the community who could get together and say, okay, what is the big picture? Okay. But for many people in Porgra today, um, they don't have enough uh, land that's high quality to grow their own food, mm. which means they need money to buy food, um, which means life can be a struggle. You know, their subsistence safety net has been taken away. Uh, and um, I think many people are just trying to make ends meet mm. and uh, try to get by at the end of the day. Many people that I've talked to in my visits since 2001 have said, my biggest goal is to get out of the valley. My goal is to take the money that's been given to me, buy a house somewhere else, get my kids into a school on the coast. I think that's, uh, increasingly today, people are looking for exit strategies. Were people um, in Pogra asking the company, a uh, mining company, to leave? I think... So, so what the current situation in Porgra is that everybody agrees that people need to be relocated off of the SML. Okay. But the question is who and when they're relocated, what kind of compensation package should they get? And the reason that people haven't been located right now is that relocated right now is that there isn't a strong agreement about how that's going to work. So there have been negotiations and political pressure going on now for decades. That, that issue of relocation was the issue that I studied. Mm -hmm. in, in 2000. When was the last time you were there? Uh, I think 2010. Oh, that's pretty recent. Yeah. So it, in these 10 years, you probably saw a lot of changes yourself. Yeah, absolutely. When I was there, it was edgy and dangerous, but exciting and promising. And um, uh, people were optimistic, even though they faced challenges. Mm -hmm. Today, when I go there, uh, people just tell me, Alex, it's changed. It has wow. changed. Wow. You see uh, people drunk very early in the morning, children sometimes. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, 
Yeah. There's not a lot of hope in Porgra today. It's it's sad. It's it's become increasingly dangerous, which is one of the reasons that uh, I haven't been back in the past couple of years. That and having children, which takes up mm. a lot of time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I'm sad to hear the, the story landed with a very sad note there. Uh, what do you see the future of uh, this Porgra area? W w you know, where is it going and, and what's going to happen both with the mines and with the local people? You know, one thing about Porgra is that you can never quite tell what is going to come. In 1976, if you had said the third largest gold mine in the world is going to be in your valley 20 years from now, nobody would have believed you. Mm -hmm. uh, or even 10 years from now, which is when that happened. So you can just never tell with Porgra, which is why I try to remain optimistic. But I, I think that increasingly today, Porgra is getting inter international media attention. And I think that more transparency, better reporting, um, telling Porgra a story to a global audience, which is what my book is trying to do, I think that will really help. Because when the, when the problem stays local, the solutions stay local, and uh, it's too easy for people to get stuck in a rut that's dysfunctional. I think the more the world knows about Porgra, the more everybody involved with Porgra will be motivated to try to work towards a good solution. A mm -hmm. um, larger question, you know, we have uh, the title of this show, Mining in the Pacific. Uh, is it, you know, progress seems to be telling a larger story of uh, the global capital coming to the local area, uh, what's happening here. So what's the larger lesson here that you want to tell? I think the larger lesson is true. It's not just true for mining, and it's not just true for timber and forestry, and it's not just true for oil. It's true for any situation where you have a global audience and a global force moving into a local area. It's true for Hurricane Katrina. It's true for the BP oil spill. Uh, people who are watching on TV, uh, TV, watching on the internet, which is where most people watch, uh, listening uh, to these things, I think that they would be better served and those local communities would be better served if we understood the local politics be behind the decisions that are being made. When we see these things for five minutes on the news, uh, we just get a little window. We never get a sense of the story behind the story. What was happening there 10 years ago and what's going to happen there next week when the camera moves away, right? This kind of thing might explode on Twitter for a week or two. Nigerian girls might make uh, a huge appearance, and th but then the global audience moves on. So during those brief moments of engagement, I think it's the job of academics, activists, journalists to make sure that people get more than just the good guy, bad guy story and begin to get the wider story of what's going on here. Because when they do that, they'll have a better understanding and they'll be able to make better decisions. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, understanding the local politics, um, do you think that's the key issue in terms of a you know, clash of understanding of, of values uh, that's uh, uh, you know, making these conflicts more widespread? I think that um, as the conflicts grow, in some sense, the mutual understanding between the different sides break down. Mm. And you just reach a point where the turbulence becomes so great, it's different, difficult for different people to work across their differences. In the case of Porgra, I think the same set of people have been engaged in negotiations for a long time. And uh, I think at this point, there's not a lot of goodwill mm. because they've faced many challenges dealing with each other. Sometimes they get fed up with each other. Mm -hmm. um, so trying to create that understanding is important in the local area. And it's also important uh, when you're dealing with a global audience, an audience who might give $5 to the Salvation Army when they read about the hurricane, or the audience who might be voting for a representative based on whether they're going to deploy troops someplace or not. Yeah, that understanding needs to happen at every level all the way up. Um, the last question would be, I, I know your, your book would help us understand this particular situation for Pogra, but in terms of uh, uh, you know, people in Hawaii, people uh, in other areas who are not directly related to uh, these uh, mining areas or remote areas, what, uh, um, what can they do to learn more about it? You know, I think the internet is such a great source of information. Uh, and I think reading high quality journalism is really the first thing. Mm -hmm. um, and if they want to dig deeper, then academic sources like my book are always available. But there are so many good sources of news out there. 
Um, there's many activist groups that are publishing on Porgora. Uh, I think protestbarrack.net is one. Um, Porgora updates come in through Barrack Gold's website, Mindwatch Canada. Um, you can also, you can read the Papua New Guinea National Newspaper now. Mm -hmm. You know, what if you just found the English language newspaper for Egypt during the Arab Spring? Mm -hmm. How interesting would it be to get that perspective? You know, just watch Al Jazeera uh, and, uh, to see what Middle East coverage is like from them. And suddenly you're like, oh, I'm getting a different kind of story than I might have gotten on Fox or uh, mainstream media in the United States. So we have to become more con uh, conscious consumers uh, in the globalized environment. Yeah, just, just try, you know, um, just try eating a little bit more broadly. Yeah, That's diversify right. Diversify your media diet. Um, control room, let's bring up uh, photo number 13 because I want to... Um, give uh, people the uh, information. Can, can you tell us uh, where can we get the book? Uh, you can buy the book from Duke University Press's website or uh, any good independent bookstore on the web. And it's also available through other major chains like Barnes & Noble and Amazon. So, yeah. And that is a Professor Alex Golub of uh, Anthropology from UH Manoa. And thank you so much for being here, for sh sharing uh, your understanding, your experience about this important issue. Thanks for having me. And this is Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Hong Jiang. And uh, I want to thank you for tuning in. I'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you. Goodbye.